Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. I am really excited for today's interview because I get to interview someone who's become a friend of mine. And as you'll hear in our interview, even kind of more than a friend, kind of family in a lot of ways. And that person is Isaac Tolpin. If you don't know who Isaac Tolpin is, I'll give you a, a brief rundown on what he's currently doing. And then you'll hear in the interview a lot about what he has done, uh, what he's what he's doing right now, and then you know what they've got planned for the future. But Isaac and his wife Angie Tolpin currently run CourageousParenting.com, which offers an amazing parenting mentor program. They also have a great podcast called Courageous Parenting. They also have an app which is called Be Courageous that you can download on like at any of the app stores. And they offer so much content. They have a community space there where you're able to connect with like-minded uh, Christians and parents and people that are wanting to pursue the same things in life that maybe you're wanting to pursue. Uh, so be sure to check all those things out. And of course, we'll link all of these things in the show notes. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about Isaac's background in business. We're going to be talking about uh, what made them move to their current location right now and how they went about doing that, the process that they went about in, in coming to that decision. Um, and then of course, we're going to be talking about parenting and raising children and then also being a resolute man which is how you can find Isaac online. He's the resolute man on Instagram. Again, we'll link all this stuff, but be sure to follow Isaac Tolpin or his wife, Angie Tolpin, or their Courageous Parenting content online because it's amazing. So with that said, I'm just gonna, actually no, not with that said, I'm gonna say a couple more things. One, folks, thank you so much for the ratings and the reviews that you've been leaving on iTunes. It's been such a blessing to Katie and I, and it's also really... It's making our podcast become more listened to. I think that's, is that a way to say it? Yeah, it's becoming more listened to. Uh, it's so fun. Our podcast is consistently uh, in the top charts on iTunes now, and we're so grateful that you guys are making that happen through listening to it, through subscribing, through you know leaving the ratings and the reviews. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, and then I don't think, oh yes, and then one other thing, men, the Growth Initiative waitlist is open. Do not miss your chance to jump in to the Fall 2022 Growth Initiative group. If you don't know if it's right for you, then go to growthinitiative.com and you can see whether or not you think this is right for you. If you're a man that wants to grow in your marriage, your ability to parent and lead your lead your home, your ability to earn more money as the provider, to have a healthy body while you're doing all those things, to have a romantic marriage, to know the Lord more. If any of those things sound good to you, go check out Growth, growth Initiative, uh, thegrowthinitiative.com. And um, actually, I'll link that below too. Just I want to make sure you guys really know where to find all these resources. Well, that was a long introduction. But now with that said, let's jump in to the interview, this interview with Isaac Tolpin. The Now That We're a Family Podcast. Isaac Tolpin, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. I'm so grateful that we get to hear from you. I know our audience has, I was just telling you before, actually, you and you and your wife, Angie, are the most requested uh, we, we're, you guys get the most requests for interviews. So thank you for making the time for this. Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. And uh, it was so great to see you and your wife not too long ago too. So that was fun. Yeah. I'm, I'm excited. A, a lot of our listeners already know, but we are, uh, even, I mean, we've been friends for a few years now, but yeah. we're in a lot of ways, a little bit more than just friends. Now there's a little bit of a familial connection yeah. now because Katie's yeah, we're like family. We are yeah, family in a way. We are. Yeah, we are. Um, and for those that don't, that don't know, Katie's younger sister, Caroline, just last year married uh, Isaac and Angie's oldest son, Austin, and, uh, and they're expecting their first, their first child. So yeah, it's pretty fun. So exciting. So it is exciting. exciting. Uh, so Isaac, I, I already, already gave kind of a brief kind of introduction description as to who you are and, and what you've done, but maybe in your own words right now, because I mean, life's dynamic, especially, you know, when you've got kids, you've got businesses, I feel like you know, you and I talked maybe a month and a half ago, but I feel like tons probably could have even changed since then. So right now, you know, when you bump into people and they ask you what you're doing, what what's the answer these days? Well, it's full-time ministry, you know, with courageous parenting and related things, but more details on that. I think it's really important to be thinking about 
the speed of change and what's happening in relation to how we provide and the value we bring to the marketplace. So it's really important that we're proactive versus reactive to those changes. Some of the things that we've been working on just to give more value out there to people as we launched uh, the Be Courageous app. Uh, very soon, we're launching a coffee subscription, Courageous Coffee. Um, you know, we have parenting books hopefully coming out at the end of the summer. Wow. Some of those different things. We have some courses that cost more, but we want to make sure that we have some lower price points. Obviously, you know, Biden is uh, ruining everybody's pocketbooks. So, uh, yeah. and the world, you know, goals of the global elite. So, I just think it's really important we're thinking about that. I would say, on a fun note, though, we're also homesteading. I don't know that I would have called it that seven months ago or a year ago but as food is getting weird in the world and all mm. these things we're we've decided to go all in and plant gardens and do all that kind of stuff yeah and your property is looking amazing too that was okay. so fun to be able to come by there last month and uh yeah and i mean and you you share on on social media as well a lot of your progress and i love seeing that you're out working in the garden i, mean, I think just today you guys were like fencing in your garden, I think, is that right? You guys are finishing the fence around yeah, one of your gardens? Yeah, right now, my uh, middle boys, and they're out there putting fence posts in um, nine feet above the ground. We get elk that comes right out here. It's just wow. incredible. A whole herd of elk every year, uh, brushing up against the trees and stuff. So now I understand, you might find this interesting, but there's really nothing you can do to prevent elk from doing something they want to do. Huh. But you can build the best fence you can and so they're putting 160 pounds of concrete in their, you know, 12 foot posts, four by fours. So we're we're doing the best we can, but wow. really, if they want to get in there, they can. Oh man, that's crazy. Good for you guys. Yeah, I love seeing all the projects you guys you guys work on. Okay, so a lot of people know what you're currently doing. I think, or they have got some, you know, knowledge about courageous parenting. That's been a, an extremely, I guess, effective. Uh, I guess, program that you guys have offered for a few years now. I actually just my, my in-laws, Chad and Janice Johnson were just telling me about it a couple weeks ago that they were going through that and they were loving that. But could you back us up a bit and give maybe a little bit more of like an origin story as to who you were, you know, growing up? Cause right now, I mean, you've got children, you guys homeschool, you're, you're building up families. You've got a strong family culture. Was, is that something that you grew up with or is that something that is kind of been developed through, you and Angie having a you know like-minded conviction over time. What was that like for you as a child? You know, it reminds me of a post I recently did, which is, you know, it doesn't matter what your past is. What matters is what you're doing today with your families. And it's more important today than ever to be intentional and biblically equipping and raising our kids because the enemy has such a, a hold on the earth right now and there's so much going on obviously God is way more powerful but it is in the Bible that this is gonna happen so we're in these fascinating times there's no fear involved but I think they are fascinating and I can see both sides because I didn't become a believer till I was 23 hmm. and I was kind of the master of my own world if you say and when I was younger I did not grow up in a Christian home and those kinds of things and I was kind of left to do a lot of the things I wanted to do and so being a non-believer and left to do whatever I want when I'm a young teenager it wasn't good so you know I always thought I'd be a business owner ever since I was a young child maybe it's because I got fired from my pizza job on the first J and <laughs> some of those things when I was really young uh, I, you know, a really cool story though is I sold my own crafts when I was either eight or nine. I had a little card table. I was in a small town, Port Townsend, Washington, is where I grew up, and I would set this table up and I would sell my little wooden boats for kids and these kinds of things. And that was such an amazing experience. And I would say, fast forward now, that has impacted me to make sure my kids experience creating something with their hands or their mind and then selling it, making a profit, because that was such hmm. a pivotal impact on me. I don't know what God has for my kids. They may be entrepreneurs or not, but I think that's a, a key experience. But anyways, fast forward, um, God really got a hold of me. My wife ended up working for me for the summer. No uh, way. A few years older than her, and I was at, we were in Portland. She grew up in Portland. I was there for business purposes. I, was, I had one more year left at University of Washington, 
And so in the summer, I was, I was, I was doing, running a business and she came in and interviewed and um, she accepted the job, although she had to talk to a couple of people that worked with me first because she was very skeptical of me. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and she showed up and then God really impressed upon her to witness to me. And mm. she wasn't interested romantically in me, but she really felt like you know, God could use him if God got a hold of him. So she witnessed to me. She shared about her trips to Turkey. She had just gotten back from a mission trip in Turkey, smuggling Bibles into Turkey, very dangerous. Wow. So she had these really radical, exciting stories to tell me. And here I am a non-believer and there's this vibrant, Holy Spirit filled human being. And I'm quickly realizing beautiful human being. And, you know, she really, the key thing she asked me, what is your purpose in life? And I had a well-developed purpose. I mean, I was speaking publicly and running a business at a young age and making good money and these kinds of things, like, like master of my own universe. I thought wow. I was complete in control. And, oh, you know, those Christians, um, you know, if they need that, if they need God, if they need the Bible, that's cool. You know, I think a lot of them are kind of weak. I don't need that. Huh. That was kind of my atheistic point of view. And uh, wow, just to cut it short, God got a hold of me. I completely had a radical conversion when I was back at school at University of Washington. And uh, ever since that night, it was late in the night, ever since that night, my life has completely changed. My wow. desires completely changed. It was really radical. Oh, wow. Praise the Lord. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's a part of your guys' story that I wasn't really that familiar with. So that's really fun for me to hear. Um, so then go from there. Cause you guys have, boy, I, you know, I'm embarrassed. Cause I think I lost track of how many kids you guys have. Do you guys have eight kids right now? We have nine. You have nine kids right now. Wow. Congratulations. That's awesome. So going from, you know, being 23, 24, running a successful business, being uh, in maybe for lack of a better, better term, kind of like an entrepreneurial rock star in a lot of ways, going from that to, uh, then being the father of nine, you know, running a ministry was like you said, your, your desires, they changed that day, but did you have this vision from that point forward or has this vision and what you're doing now really evolved over time? I find the more I lean into God, the more opinionated, uh, he is about what I do. Hmm. I, I don't know if that's just me or other people have experienced this, but he really, as I get older too, he becomes more and more opinionated, like literally slamming doors shut and saying, go this direction. Wow. I would have never, and I, I would say that I'm always thinking about what's ahead, even 10 years down the road, you know, thinking about doing things today for the future. I've always kind of been like that, but I never thought I would be teaching parenting. I didn't know anything about parenting. I didn't had even been around kids until I had my own kids. Wow. And so I didn't even believe in marriage until I became a believer. So wow. literally God had to replace and put in me a new heart for these things. And he did. And it was really a amazing. And I'm so thankful. But I think that the key is, is that we're obedient, that we're looking at the Lord and we're obedient. And I would say from day one of my conversion, I'm like, what does the Bible say? And how can I be obedient to what the Lord wants for me to do and operate in this world and, and so forth? And so, although I didn't have the vision for this, I had vision for different things, like being retired by 35 and being in the business world and doing marketplace ministries, which I did some of that, I didn't retire, but I did some of that. In fact, God had a different plan for me. He decided, hey, let's have you be really successful and then I'll take it all away from you. Hmm. That you go do in this next season what I actually want you to do that you would never do unless I took everything away. Wow. So that's actually what happened. He took everything financially away, I think six years ago. and. It, by the grace of God, he's restored us and it's incredible. And I'm so thankful for that experience because it re I really needed to be humbled. And anybody listening, I would just say, are we willing to be radically obedient to the Lord and do the things that he wants us to do? Is our agenda also God's agenda? And you want to make sure of that because you could be building something over here and if he wants you to do something else, he'll make sure it happens. Hmm. Wow. That's so good to hear. Like you said, is, is our agenda, his agenda, you know, is, is it submitted to his ultimate authority and his vision? 
for our life. That's so good to hear. You know, what's interesting is I wanted to make a point to share this because literally like a couple, maybe a few months ago, four or five months ago, I was going through some old journals and uh, I keep my journals and I had a journal from 2015. I can't remember if I told this to you when I was at your house, but I'll tell it to you now. And in 2015, I had recently moved to Bend, Oregon. And I had a journal entry where I had listed five men who I wanted to make a point to be around because I really was believing that you become the common denominator of the five people you spend the most time with. And I had just met you. You probably don't even remember this, but um, Jacob Hermeling introduced me to you at a co at Stackhouse Coffee there. And I uh, he introduced me to you, told me a little about, 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 about what you do. You talked to me. And I wasn't married, you know, I wasn't dating my wife, had never heard about you guys. And I wrote down, uh, you were one of the five guys I wanted to make a point to be around after meeting you that one day. And I was like, wow, what the Lord's so good to, to like, I guess, just give me that desire and then bring you into my life. Because who would have known that we were, you know, in a church together, you know, a couple of years later, we now kind of related. So I thought that was really fun. And you left a, a strong impression on me that from that first time that I met you, which is kind of going back to that and a little bit about your story, because we met you guys when you were in Bend. We were at a home church. But since then, you guys, you even mentioned six years ago, you guys did a pretty big pivot because you were doing business. You were doing a ton of consulting. You were running companies. And now you've made a move to Idaho. You guys are doing full-time ministry. Can you kind of walk us through what that looked like? Maybe even from like a marriage standpoint, how you and Angie worked through that? Because transition is an inevitable part of life. And I've found that if you're not united with your spouse, that can become a very painful season. But if you are united with your spouse, it can be very doable. So what was that like for you guys? Well, I think the first tip I would say as we go into this is that you've got to nurture your marriage during peacetime when, you know, everything's kind of normal and hmm. nothing bad is, too bad is happening. There's always some kind of challenge, right? But nothing crazy. There's those peace times where sometimes we can get kind of relaxed about our marriage, we can get relaxed about things and we're not strengthening. And I think wow. a marriage is either strengthening or digressing, like any mm. relationship, but especially a marriage relationship. And so we've got to be working really hard on that peacetime. I am so thankful that that is something I was doing because when everything fell apart in my business world, when all the finances were taken away, literally selling my watch, um, selling guns, whatever to provide for family, eventually selling our sprinter van um, to have some runway and that kind of thing that well, was important to our family. But I remember all those things and when we were deeply hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt because a business failed and that, that debt followed me, I was so encouraged by my wife just rallying around me, my kids, and it was an extremely humbling experience, but I remember the purity of the experience of, I literally have nothing financially, but I have everything. I'm like rich in family. Wow. And we're all in aligned and we're all excited. And with these three months to make courageous parenting happen. And it was really, really fascinating to see Austin learning the tech side and editing videos for free to the kids, you know, praying together every morning for the ministry and all these things. And it just literally became this all family effort. And I'm so thankful for that. And I'm kind of missing some details in between and some timeline stuff. Now I realize it, but that's kind of the gist of it. And I think that um, you really want to nurture that closeness in your marriage and you don't want to hide things from your kids either. Some things you're not going to tell them based on age, but I really just, God humbled me and I, was sat there in front of my family and shared the mistakes I made and shared what God was doing. And we constantly, you know, proclaimed the answers to prayers, which were happening all the time. See, God wants to be glorified. And are you allowing him to be glorified in your life? Because you're pressing forward, not in your own strength, but in God's strength. And are your kids witnessing that? Hey, folks, our kids are going to launch into an increasingly uncertain world. It is vital that they experientially experience God. They, that they see you experiencing God, that they see you relying on God. And if we're so strong and we're only doing things that we're capable of and we're taking credit naturally for all the things we're doing in front of our kids, what kind of 
faith experience are they growing into? So I look back and I go, wow, that was so powerful for how it impacted our kids. But remember, as leaders of your family, as parents, as dads, it's so important that we act in humility. Sometimes we're like, well, I want to hide that because it's embarrassing. Or I want to hide this because, um, you know, they don't need to know that hmm. or whatever the case may be. Just how about don't we want our kids' prayers? Yes. God listens to all of us, but I, I, when I read the Bible, he's like, he for sure is listening to those kids. Yes, you're so right. That's so cool to hear. And you know, what's cool is that I can attest to your and Angie's steadfast faith throughout that season. Cause we were, I mean, we were doing church with you guys. We were, you and I were talking every Sunday over coffee, um, sometimes during the week too. And you guys, you weren't hiding that you were, the businesses were experiencing some, some trials, which was resulting in some financial difficulties, but your faith and your outlook on life it really stayed steadfast and, and extremely positive. I mean, even in retrospect, I'm kind of, I'm almost embarrassed and kind of humbled because of how much you poured into my life. I feel like during that season, when you guys, you know, your guys' world is getting tossed to and fro and you were counseling me on different jobs to pursue or different businesses to pursue and really giving up your time. And so it's really, a, it's a true testimony of your guys' confidence in the Lord. And, and it's cool to see that he has led you through that to a very purposeful destination that you guys are still in the course of. Well, I appreciate that. But I think that that's what the body of Christ is for, right? We all lean on each other. Hmm. And I'm so thankful, you know, really running the race with people because people came around us and supported us and believed in us and were praying for us and asking how we're doing on a weekly basis. And even to the point of, you know, someone gave us a Christmas tree to someone else brought us meat to these kinds of things. And just to be humbled in that way from, you know, my past to where, you know, we had everything we needed and more and finances were never an issue in our whole marriage. You know, it was always growing financially and all these things and seemed like fruitfulness was going to be continuing forever. You kind of think that, right? Yep. And when, when, when the challenge happens, you really see where you've sowed seeds, like in relationships and so forth. And I think today, regardless of where people go to church, it is vital that you are building deep and rock solid relationships with a few people, at least three other families. It is vital that you have those close relationships because you never know what's going to happen around the corner and we need to help each other. And so mm. as much as maybe you're saying I helped you, it helped me to be valuable because mm. frankly, I was so humbled in that time. I didn't even, I didn't even teach other people very much. I really was just, okay, I'm just going to focus on what the Lord wants and be super obedient to him. And I'm not going to push and I'm not going to try too hard to influence anybody. This is a learning time for me. And I think sometimes we need to get quiet and we need to learn and not um, just push forward our own agendas and things like that. Wow. Wow. That's so cool to hear. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Now, to where you guys are now, could you kind of share? Because I know a lot of families go through transitions, moving, they relocate. And Katie and I were talking, I think, after we saw you guys last month. Angie was talking to Katie and Katie was like, they were so intentional when they made their move. They had a game plan. And can you kind of talk us through what that was, how you guys ended up living where you're living right now? I love that topic. It's the second most popular podcast we ever did on Courageous Parenting, which is wow. strategic relocation. Um, we love Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon is like the most beautiful place you could live. Everything's yeah. close. You have all the aspects. It's sun, sunny there most of the year. You know, yeah. it's just a great place. But, you know, when you're living somewhere, you kind of become like a slowly cooked frog. You don't mm -hmm. really realize the change. It's incremental change and you kind of accept it because change is hard. Yeah. And so we went, when COVID happened and it was Oregon, so they were very strict about COVID. And I'm like, we aren't wearing masks. That is just not something we're going to do. And so we got COVID in February pretty, pretty quick after it came into the United States or whatever. And we quarantined for a month and did all that. And we all made it through, praise the Lord. 
we left on an RV trip. We went to Texas, Arizona, places that weren't requiring masks. And we went on a six week trip just to, okay, we're, my kids are not going to grow up in that way. And we came back to Bend and just in that six week time of being away, we could see the massive change that already happened. Hmm. And I already, I kind of thought COVID was going to come and go and wasn't that big of a deal as far as the virus itself. You could quickly start to tell that after, you know, a month. But what I sensed was this is going to be used and this is going to be human behavior is going to get weird. Hmm. Now, I remember thinking that human behavior is going to get weird. And I think the world is changing dr more dramatically. So I thought also we have some older kids and we're like, we asked ourselves the question, would I recommend my kids raise their families here? Hmm. What a good question. Yes. A resounding no. No way would I want my grandkids to be raised in this place that is obviously deteriorating um, from a political and morality standpoint. I almost look at Bend, Oregon as like little California now. Um, mm -hmm. Just in the way, if you go to the parks, you got to shield your kids eyes right. things and things like that. They yes. literally changed like that. So anyways, uh, those are some of the things obviously you can't go over everything, but Idaho uh, from a strategic standpoint, uh, well, where we live in Idaho has about the same amount of sun. You can grow just about anything. It actually is beautiful. You have to find the right parts for it to be beautiful, but it is beautiful. And um, it has just been an absolute best move. Very important. Now, the transitions. How do you get the marriage and the family on board? I think it's important to have family meetings and include people. Hmm. So we talk to the kids. We go, hey, what do you think about this? And these kinds of things. And they know that we're not going to make our decision only based on what they say, but they feel very respected and very included in the process. And I think because of that, they ask very, they act very maturely and they were all on board, even though we had, and we still have fantastic relationships that live there. So everybody became on board. And I think that's important. I think sometimes there's a lack of communication that happens that creates challenges in relationships and marriage for making big changes and there's always one spouse that is more resistant to change and so the other spouse needs to be patient and grace giving about that and lots of communication and handle the objections and talk about them and date nights and so forth but i think it's very important angie and i actually in this case we're just like we feel the Lord is moving us there. Uh, we feel like it's very important. And there's another uh, side note is we could also afford to buy a house in Idaho. And that was another thing. Uh, and we believe if we wait at all, we won't be able to buy in Idaho either. And that ended up being true. Actually. Yeah. Good call. Good call. Yeah. Well, what a cool, what a cool story. Can you kind of explain to the listeners that aren't familiar with Courageous Parenting, what it is, what's your guys' program, how does that look, and really, who's it Who's it for? Yeah, Courageous Parenting is a weekly podcast show. It comes out every Tuesday. You can listen to it anywhere you do. CourageousParenting.com also has the episodes. Uh, we also created a parenting mentor program, which is a six-week six self-paced course with interaction with us that really helps parents to biblically equip their kids regardless of age to launch into this world there's so many things you can do when they're little that are important and obviously all the questions people have about obedience and discipleship and all these different things so we really created one program for that because we got so many questions on that um, in addition the be courageous app is wherever you download apps and that is a premium app meaning you pay for it 8.99 a month but that's because it's a serious investment, but it also prevents people from coming in unless they're intentional hmm. believers and serious about it. So what we've seen is this amazing community of believers that feel comfortable sharing anything. It actually is a social media app. It's just not controlled by big tech and there's no yeah. big brother looking in. 
Wow. That's awesome. I love that. Now <laughs> you guys have been running your actual program for a couple of years now. When did that start? Was that 2018? I think it's three years. Three, three years. years. Yeah. Wow. So you've been able to witness firsthand. Cause I mean, like you said, you guys have real time interactions with a lot of, with these parents that are going through the yeah. courses and the programs. Um, and so you've been able to witness many different styles of family of parenting with that over the last three years, are there like two or three top things that you look at and that, that, that you can look back and say, Oh, these are kind of some common pitfalls parents have when they come into our program. Like, you know, yeah. this is a common theme, even in Christian homes where people are missing this or they're doing this and they shouldn't be. Are there some things like that? Absolutely. We always get questions about boundaries around extended family members. Hmm. Um, in this day and age, it's like, how do we, if you become an intention, more intentional parent, then maybe you're not wanting to do sleepovers anymore. Or maybe, you know, you don't want the TV on just blaring about things when you're at grandpa's house or whatever the thing is. So we get lots of questions. That seems to be a recurring thing. So peer relationships, um, extended family boundaries around that. Even when people live in cul-de-sacs and kids playing on the street, how do you set boundaries and safeguards because of the, you know, the challenges that are happening today? The other wow. thing is marriage alignment and communication is really low. Hmm. Not in every case, but there's a lot of opportunity for growth there. I've noticed when people come into the program or questions we get from the podcast and so forth. It's and sometimes they're not even things you realize there's not alignment on until you're learning something new that's really important to equip your kids. And then all of a sudden that creates a marriage conversation, but that's really vital And being on the same page is really important too. I would say too, that, um, I would say too, that, um, uh, people are lonely. Hmm. That's, that seems to be, it seems like, the more intentional people get about their marriage and parenting, the harder it is to find like-minded people to run the race with. At mm. least that is what people are sharing with us. Interesting. You know, you and Angie are unique in that you guys are high achievers. You guys are go-getters. You make stuff happen. And so you guys are, you move to a new place and it's like you are going to make a community. You are going to find friends and find some common ground. You guys started meeting at a home church. I mean, you guys started hosting a home church and in uh, and, and, and facilitating that. Is that something that you encourage people to do? Like what, what are some, like maybe some practical tips for creating that community? Because I mean, not everybody has the, you know, the charisma and the winsomeness as, you know, Isaac and Angie, or maybe they're not as comfortable getting out there. Are there some like practical things people can do to maybe find a church, to find close friends that, you, that you've seen work for different people? Yeah, you know, and we visited churches uh, for about a year and it was so fun to see what God's doing. And we made some friends with pastors and things like that. And I think that, uh, first of all, on the churches, look at their website and you can tell on a website, I always look at who the leaders are and say, okay, are they old enough to have fruit in their life? Hmm. Are they, you know, um, are they, is based on who's on their leadership and so forth. Are they being biblical about what the Bible, holding to what the Bible says about leadership and teaching and things like that in the church? And so you can narrow it down a little bit by looking at their websites so you don't waste a Sunday. And then you go visit, and we did too. And then my, our recommendation, my recommendation would be hospitality. I say our because mm. my wife says that a lot too, but she's really so good at that. But hospitality, your home, whether you're renting a house or you own a house, you've got this house, and that's God's. He provided that for you. Mm. And it's for your family. That's a good thing. He's a good God. But it's also an embassy. It's to share the gospel with people. It's to sharpen one another inside of. Whether you do home church or not, that is how you build friendships, is you invite people over. And you guys are such a great example of that because we're a large family. Back then, I think we had eight kids when you had us over to your little apartment. But I remember oh, yeah. we were living in a little apartment in Bend. And this is just before you moved out of Bend, I think. And you invited us over and you had this, it was a wonderful place, but it was small. And, but it didn't feel small. And the mm. reason it didn't is because you guys didn't care. 
Hmm. You just had us over. Our kids were sitting on the floor. We're sitting on the couch. We're having a great meal together. We're playing in the yard. It was a memorable experience and we loved it. And I think we all grew closer because you did that. Hmm. So many times people don't invite someone over because they're like, where am I going to sit people or what am I going to do? And I think we need to throw all that out, out the window. People can sit on the floor. People can sit outside. Well, the, the key is, is the heart of it. And yeah. you exemplified that well. I remember that. And I think it's so important. Hospitality, meet new people and be intentional too. Look for people. There are people everywhere that are like-minded, but it's up to you to look for them. And you got to pray too. And are you being guarded in your relationships? Are you letting past hurts guard make you kind of guarded and standoffish? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe people, maybe you're not approachable. That's something to think about too. Wow, that that is so helpful to hear. I love that you call your home or our homes an embassy. You know, we're told in the scripture that we're ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And so you're like, well, yeah, I guess that would make our home an embassy while we're here on earth, you know? And as as such, we need to use this for that purpose, for the purpose of our king, for the purpose of our ruler. And hospitality plays a big, big role in that. Um, that's so cool to hear. Now, kind of as we wrap things up here, I'm wondering, you referenced a few things uh, that you guys have coming up, the coffee subscription. Um, I also, I'm, I, I'm still unclear you guys have such cool looking stuff. I'm like looking behind you. You got your resolute man hat. You've got the cool flag up there. Can people get this cool stuff? Like you guys have, you got all your stuff looks awesome. Is that available to the public? Um, some of it is courageousparenting.com. Okay. There's a shop and some of it is the, the resolute man hats, um, will be coming out at some point. Uh, quality is super important. I haven't been able to these are super quality, but being able to distribute them effectively, we're working on a fulfillment center right now to where we can be more choosy about the products we have. But the products we do sell, like you know this mug, Dad nice. loves leads, protects, and things nice. like that, you can find at ResoluteMan.com, and then we have another store at CourageousParenting.com, which has the mom mug and so forth. Right. So those are the two shops: ResoluteMan.com. CourageousParenting.com. There's other resources there too. And you can get access to the app and information about the app at CourageousParenting.com and the courses and all that stuff. So that's kind of a good spot. A good hub. And people will know about the coffee subscription. They'll learn about that through there and stuff. Yeah, that's going to be its own website. Um, uh, 50% done with the website. Nice. Super excited. Premium Italian roasted coffee. And some people go, well, why coffee? I go, I really like coffee. Yeah. People keep drinking it yeah. i also you know kind of interesting i don't know if there's any preppers listening i wouldn't call myself a prepper except i do prep things nice. so maybe i am a prepper anyways but i'm not your, a prepper like your property's pretty your, your property's pretty, pretty sweet. sweet i i will say your property looks too good to be a prepper property like <laughs> yeah. up, up here in north idaho when you go to a prepper property I'm not it's, a prepper. Yeah, it's like, no, you guys aren't quite there. But you, No, we're yeah. literally trying to grow our first tomatoes. So we're, nice. we're at the very <laughs> beginning stages of sustainability. But, you know, it's funny because every once in a while I read articles, and this one article is like the top 10 things that if you ever get in a situation where you can only barter, you should have. And you know what? I think number five on the list was coffee beans. I believe it. That's so cool. I love it. it. I mean, that's a very, so not only is it enjoyable as a commodity, it's very practical and becomes very close to a necessity, you know, at certain, yeah, I mean, certain seasons and there's of There's something life. about it when you're sitting, now it could be tea. Tea would have the same effect, by the way. Maybe we'll have courageous tea, but uh, it's, it's relational too when you're drinking. It's like yes. every podcast episode, I'm always drinking a cup of coffee. I think yep. it just, it calms me down. It makes me feel like we're just talking. I don't yeah. know. There's some some ambiance to it. I like. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with you there. Uh, in regards to Resolute Man, you know, we there's fathers listening, young fathers, young men. What is like one thing you wish you could speak to men? I mean, you get to speak to men, and, and I'm going to make sure I link your yeah. Instagram, of course, your guys' podcast, because even though it's a you guys have a parenting platform, you specifically speak to men pretty directly, which yeah. I'm really grateful for. Oh. Um, and just as, just as Angie speaks to women, you know, very directly on your guys' platforms. Uh, and so I want to make sure I, I direct all the men there, but right here, like what's something when you look out, you kind of step back and you say, you look at the, the church as a whole, maybe as, as best as we can. 
and you say, like, what's one thing you could just wish you could tell the young fathers in the church? If you could, think, if you, yeah, sorry. I think good question. I think that Genesis three, um, the Adam complex where Adam was passive, um, you know, when, um, he wasn't leading his wife well. And, and I just think that passivity is a huge problem. I feel it inside. I feel it. There's moments where I feel like I should probably do this, but I feel a little uncomfortable in the moment, or is this the right time? Or should I say anything? And these kinds of things. And I've been working a muscle and I'm, I am trying to become more of a resolute man. And it's a movement to help men become more resolute. And resolute means unwavering and admirably purposeful. Hmm. And from a biblical standpoint, how can we be unwavering and admirably purposeful about what the Bible says in sharing the gospel, equipping our kids, loving our wives, and standing firm against the wiles of the enemy? And there's so many times where people don't stand for them. They're not resolute because it's going to hurt a relationship or they fear how people are going to look at them and these kinds of things. And I had, I've gone off the deep end in a good way, I think. And I'm hoping other men go off the deep end in a good way. It's like, do not sacrifice biblical truth for the sake of relationships. Love people well, though. And sometimes hmm. loving people well is sharing truth in love. Hmm. And I have a scripture for everybody. I love the scripture for the men. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be watchful. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men. Be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Let's not forget that last sentence. Let all that you do be done in love. And that's being a resolute man. And I think we need more people to reject passivity. It's a daily process. I have to reject passivity every day. And I think too many men aren't even cognizant of their own passivity. I think we need to get honest with ourselves and go, where are we being passive and not reading scripture to our family every day? Where are we being passive and not praying with our wives? Where are we being passive uh, when it comes to protecting our kids because we're scared to tell somebody something or create a a, a little bit of a boundary to protect our kids. You know, it's so important. We need to be decisive. Too many people are indecisive. When you talk about the move, we were decisive. We felt the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We had evidence for challenges coming. We it, it had an opportunity related thing, which has to do with having a home. We're like, we're moving. Two weeks back from that six week trip, we decided we're moving. Two months later, we were in Idaho. Hmm. Wow. So you got to be decisive because otherwise you meander and you're not proactive. You become reactive in leading your family in a reactive way today is going to cause harm to your family. Hmm. We need to be proactive. We need to be close with God. The Holy Spirit's in us. We need to be receptive to what the Holy Spirit is prompting us so that we can hear from God, make decisions. He's supernatural. He's going to give you supernatural wisdom. Make decisions early before the consequences come and now you're reacting and people are getting hurt. Hmm. Wow. That's so good. And you already alluded to a lot of that kind of like that proactivity through our conversation when you were talking about pouring into your marriage during the peace times, you know, when you're not, yeah. when you're not in those crazy and that's being proactive. It's the same thing with our children. You know, we're, I love the Bible says to train up your children in the way that they should go. That's a proactive thing. When you're training for something, it means you're preparing for something. It doesn't mean you're just reacting to something. You're proactively equipping and training, you know, whether it's you're training your physical body to, for a race or, you know, training for a job that you want. And that's what we're called to do with our children, which is very proactive. So I love how you use that language, especially for men, because you cannot lead in a reactionary way. Obviously, if we have to react, we want to lead with, we want to be able to react with wisdom, but leading means being out ahead and being proactive and, and where we're leading our family. So thank you for sharing that, Isaac. Yeah. Amen, brother. Well, we're going to wrap things up here. I'm so grateful, Isaac, for you and for Angie and everything you guys do. I want to make sure I link everything. Um, yeah. Any parting words, any like secret projects that you guys can reveal, you know, do we get any insider information for any upcoming podcast episodes or or uh or programs 
Well, I just want to say thank you to you guys. You guys are doing a great podcast, and uh, God is using your family in mighty ways. And so uh, we want to fan your flames, too, and just appreciate you guys and love you guys as well. And um, I, don't, I don't know that there's anything super secret other than at some point, the desire of my heart is that the Resolute Man podcast launches. Hmm. And it just hasn't been as high of a priority as other things. We have to prioritize things. And you might be going, well, why is coffee more important than the podcast? Well, another podcast is just expense. It's just, a, it's just investment. It costs money. So we're actually, in the way the economy is changing and things like that, we're trying to further stabilize the ministry with some different kinds of subscription products and offerings that provide tremendous value. So that is really important for the for the vibrancy of the ministry and our family. But, man, I feel a deep calling to launch a weekly guest show, uh, the Resolute Man Podcast, which is other men like me trying to striving to be resolute. Oh, I would love that. I mean, you've got one listener right here already. So I'm, I'm going to be an early, early adopter of that one. So yeah, let's get that thing going. Get that coffee subscription up so we can get the podcast going. I love it. Thank you so much, Isaac. Again, so grateful for what you do. And um, yeah, thank you again for your time. Yeah, great to be here. Awesome. Awesome.